If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 in the Pew Bible. If you're using a Pew Bible, it's on page 843. We're going to uh, look at a, a section of Scripture and, uh, and jump right into it. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse uh, 25 through 27. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Verse 27, he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. An expert of the law, uh, some versions say it's a scribe. We know him as a Pharisee. A Pharisee was, was a, somebody that professionally uh, was studying and, and keeping the law, making sure that the law was correct. They were constantly... Uh, judging others to make sure that they were following the law. And so what we see here is, is uh, this expert of the law trying to test Jesus, trying to trap Jesus. And we know that all the time Jesus was in this position. There were the Pharisees, they, they, they were bothered by Jesus and his message and, and what he did. And so they were always trying to trap him and trying to trip him up. And so once again, we see the Pharisee or the expert of the law come to Jesus and say, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds to the expert in the law and says, well, what's the law say? What's the law say? And he, he really kind of turns the table because then he says, and how do you interpret it? What's the law say and how do you interpret it? Now the law that's being referred to is the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law. In Deuteronomy 6 it says that this law, we are to know it. We are to pass it on to the next generation. We're to live it out. All right. And so uh, it's the Old Testament law that they're referring to. And so the Pharisees asking Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, what's the law say? You study the law, you know the law, you keep the law, what's the law say? Well, the law says to love God and love your neighbor. In, in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, we, we see a very similar conversation where Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? Right? Out of all the laws, what's the most important one? And in, in Matthew 22 and in Mark chapter 12, we see Jesus responds in both of those. He says, love God, love others. Now, we're not real sure if this Luke account, if Luke's account here in chapter 10 is of the same conversation that Matthew and Mark are referring to, or it could be a different one. Like we said, Jesus was constantly being tested. He was constantly being being tried to, to say, oh, you know, are you going to say something that goes against the law so we can arrest you? And so we're not sure if this is the same uh, situation that Matthew and Mark are in that Luke is now re reporting about or if this is something else. But what we do know is that Luke goes further in his explanation of this law. Luke goes on and, and he says, he gives us a little more substance about loving your neighbor. In verse 28, Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. It's almost as if Jesus says, well, I knew you knew the law. Now go do it. Why don't you go put it into action, right? We have to remember that the question that the expert of the law asks is, how do I inherit eternal life? How do I inherit eternal life? And, and, uh, and the response is by both loving God and loving your neighbor. Loving God and loving others. Now, within the life of the church, we talk about loving God often, right? What's it mean to be a Christian? What's it mean to be a disciple? What's it mean to, to, uh, to be obedient? What's it mean to love God? And, and what's it mean to accept God's love? We talk about that often, and we should. But what about the second part? What about the loving others part? 
How often do we talk about that? How, how are we doing in that realm? Because the question from the expert of the law was, how do I inherit eternal life? Well, what's the law say? Love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus says, go do it. We do, we talk a lot about loving God, but, but what about this other part of loving others? Now, some of you are sitting there thinking, well, pastor, I don't know who my neighbor is. Like, can you define who my neighbor is so I know how to love them? Because my, some neighbors I don't really love and some are easier to love, right? And some of you are like processing exactly how can I get around this? And guess what? So did the expert of the law. Because look at the next verse, verse 29, wanting to justify himself, wanting to figure out the loopholes, he asked the question, who is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Who's this apply to? And what we see is Jesus responds with a parable. A parable is a story with a lesson to it. A parable is a teaching illustration. And Jesus responds with a parable, verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. I want you to understand, I want you to picture in the context, uh, that journey from, from Jerusalem to Jericho is about 17 to 21 miles. Okay? The, the, the journey, the road that they would have been traveling on, is known as the way of the blood. I'll explain that here in a second. Okay? So a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and, they, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be do, uh, going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil, uh, or pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. This passage right here, this passage is so full of, of teaching points, and, uh, but it's also an encouragement for us because it's a lesson it, on how we can love our neighbor. All right, love God. Love others. This is an illustration. This is how this works. And so Jesus begins by saying there is a man who is leaving Jer or Jerusalem, going to Jericho. Right? That's not uncommon. Jericho was kind of a bedroom community for Jerusalem. Jericho was, was you know, that's where everybody lived, and then they went to Jerusalem to work. So a man leaving Jerusalem, going to Jer Jericho is not uncommon. It says that a man, he is beaten. Right? He is robbed and beaten and left for dead. That is not uncommon. I told you, this path is known as the way of the blood. All right? Now, if you see that street sign, you know, you'll be like, no, nah, I don't think so. But the other way to get from Jerusalem to Jericho was twice as long. And so this was the path, but it was a regular occurrence that robbers would hide out in the clefts of the rock or in the bushes. They would hide out and they would wait for somebody to come by and they would jump them and rob them. So for Jesus to be telling us the story that the man is leaving Jerusalem to go to Jericho and he's robbed, that's not uncommon. But then Jesus shares with us that on that same road, there were three other men. The first one was a priest. The priest would be a Jew, all right? So actually, the man that was robbed, the man that starts, if he's leaving Jerusalem, heading to Jericho, the, the common thought is he is a Jew. And now, all of a sudden, a priest is on the same road. The priest is a man of God. A priest is, he, he works in Jerusalem. He probably works in the temple. 
And now all of a sudden, the priest, also a Jew, is leaving Jerusalem, heading home. He's leaving his work and going back home. And he happens to see a man on the road. Well, the priest is a good guy. Like, surely he's going to stop, right? I, he's a man of God. He's the, one that's, he's the one that's talking about the laws, and he's the one that's pre uh, preaching about the laws. He's the one that's making sure everybody else is living the law. Surely he's going to know that he's supposed to love others. Surely, right? He'll stop. But what do we see? The priest walks by on the other side. Well, then Jesus tells us about, about a Levite. A Levite, they are uh, from the tribe of Levi. They were known as set-apart people. They were set apart because they were assistants to the priest. They had a special God-ordained job. They were to work in the temple alongside the priest, and, but they were like the assistants. They made sure everything got done right. So when there were rituals that had to be accomplished or had to be done, the the Levites were the ones that made sure everything happened the right way. They made sure the timing all worked out. They, were, they made sure that the priests were following the laws. The Levites, they were the assistants. They were the right-hand man to the priest. So the priest, or the, so the Levite comes alongside, right, the same road, leaving Jerusalem, heading to Jericho. Again, not uncommon, probably leaving work, going home. A Levite. He made sure that the law was followed. A Levite was a religious man. The priest was a religious man. And on the outside, they looked religious. But Jesus' parable tells us that both the priest and the Levite walk by. And then Jesus goes in and he says, well, there's a third guy, it's a Samaritan. And now the expert of the law, if he was standing there as, he's, as Jesus is telling the story, he'd probably be like, hold on, stop the story right here. Because the Samaritan in this story does not make sense. Because Jews and Samaritans hated each other. They don't just dislike each other, they despise each other. Now, the Levite, the Levite was in a unique situation where he worked with both groups. He was the kind of the bridge. He worked with the priests, the Jews, but he also, he, he was in the community, and he, he knew the people, and he, he worked with Samaritans. And so for Jesus to raise that a Samaritan is in this story, like, if you're hearing the story for the first time, you're thinking, oh, uh, <laughs> I know what the Samaritan's going to do. He's going to go over, he's going to kick the guy. And he's going to see if they left any other coins. And then he's going to kick them again as he walks away. That's the kind of guy a Levite would have been in this story. So for Jesus to bring into this story, there's a Jewish man who is beaten and left for dead. And now all of a sudden, there is a Samaritan coming in. This isn't going to be good. This isn't good. But Jesus goes on. And he says, uh, he, he shares in his, his illustration that the Samaritan took pity on the man. That the Samaritan was moved with the compassion. That compassion that's deep down in your gut that, that just makes you have to do something. When you see it and you have to respond, you can't just turn away and ignore it. There is something that motivates you. And now what we see is that so the Samaritan... The man who would have normally kicked him and spat on him and continued to walk, now all of a sudden the Samaritan stops and bandages his wounds. Could have been his own shirt sleeve. He bandages his wounds. He pours on oil and wine onto the wound to serve as a salve. He puts the man on his own donkey. He takes him to an inn. He spends the night with him to take care of him. In the next morning, he gives the hotel clerk a couple coins and says, if there's any extra expense, let me know. This story of the Good Samaritan has taken a complete turn from the cultural understanding of that day. 
Jesus is talking to the expert of the law, and he's bringing into this, this picture the Samaritan who cares for a Jew who has been beaten up. And in verse 36, Jesus asked the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who was beaten? Which one of these three lived out, love your neighbor as yourself? (laughs) Well, the one who had mercy on him. It's also interesting, notice, notice this, the expert of the law, the Jew, he couldn't even say the Samaritan. He says the one who had mercy. The one who had mercy on him. He was, he was a neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. Love God and Love your neighbor. In this, in this little parable, there are some things that we can learn about what it means to, to love our neighbors. Now, the first one is that everyone qualifies as a neighbor. Everyone qualifies as a neighbor. When you're trying to process through in your mind, well, who am I supposed to love and who's my neighbor? You can't pick and choose. A neighbor is everyone, those that you may like and those you may not like, those you get along with and those you don't get along with, those that you have things in common with, those you don't. We don't don't get to pick and choose. It, It covers everybody. And here's the reason why. Because everybody has been created by God. Praise the Lord, right? God has a plan and a purpose for us. God loves us. We're his children. We're the ones that turn our back on him and walk away. God never stops loving. So so what we see here is that everyone qualifies as a neighbor. The second thing we see is that loving our neighbor will cost us. Sometimes it'll interrupt your schedule. Sometimes it's going to take your time. Sometimes it's going to cost you money. Sometimes it's going to move you out of your comfort zone. Sometimes it's going to be possessions. But loving your neighbor is going to cost you something. And the other thing we see is that loving your neighbor will also change you. Loving your neighbor will change you. This normal situation between a Jew and a Samaritan would not turn out well. And Jesus is saying, here's two guys that are from two opposite ends of the spectrum sharing life together. Loving one another, caring for each other, wanting, wanting them to succeed. And so loving your neighbor changes us. It changes me. Love God and love your neighbors. Now we talk about the loving God often. But I think sometimes we need to talk about loving others just as much. There's times that... Uh, There's times I can find myself discouraged or questioning um, life where I start asking myself, man, is, does anybody get it? Is anybody like actually listening? Is anybody living the life? Is anybody, is anybody loving God and loving others? And there's times, I mean, you know, it's life. Things fall apart. People yell at you and say bad things about you and you know, you, you, you go through it. And I, and, and I do too. And, and there's times I get discouraged and I'm like, man, is, is it making sense? Like, how come it's not real? How come we're not alive? How come, how come we're not doing both? We're, we're loving God and loving others. And I can find myself in kind of a little pity party. <laughs> and especially when somebody else comes and asks me, hey, Anybody in your church actually living out the Christian life, being a disciple? I'm like, um, hope so. I don't know. But you know what? This morning I want to share with you that yes, there are. Right? I firmly believe that some of you are living the life of loving God and loving others. And within our church, there are many people that are loving, loving God and loving others. 
And, and sometimes I, I don't know all the stories and I don't know all the details and, and there are things that go on that I'm not a privy to and that's okay. But, but to be able to celebrate God and to celebrate the kingdom and to celebrate as a church, I want to share with you some stories that I'm aware of. I want to share with you some tidbits of how I know that we have some people that are actually loving God and loving others and trying to do something, all right? I want you to know that I know that there are people within our church that are inviting friends and neighbors and co-workers and complete strangers to their homes for meals so that they can talk about life and talk about Christ, all right? I know that there are people that are taking time out of their schedule to go into other people's homes to talk about life and talk about Christ. I know that there are people helping neighbors with yard work, helping people, helping neighbors with offering rides. I, I've even heard of stories of some of you helping your neighbors pay their bills. There are people within our church that are seeking out coworkers at work in the break room, going over and sitting with them to make sure that they are not sitting by themselves. There are students within our church that are doing the same thing at school. They are going to sit by those who are, are lonely, sitting by themselves to make sure that they feel included, asking them about their lives, about their family, about, about their, their friendships. There are people who are using their God-given abilities and talents to walk along others who are in need. So if you have, I know there's some of you that have construction skills that, are, that give of your time and energy to help others. And, and there are some that understand policy and there's some that do great with childcare and others that prepare meals. And they're coming alongside one another that for the love of Christ. We have individuals who give up their time to serve on nonprofit boards and help with community projects to help people who they would never have a chance to interact with. We have a couple people who are meeting together in their, in, their, in their neighborhoods for the sole purpose of prayer and the sole purpose of reading the Bible. We have some who are faithful in sending cards of encouragement to people as they are prompted by the Lord. We have a group of ladies on Tuesday morning, a group of ladies on Tuesday morning that uh, for the last few weeks they've been gathering together with their sewing machines and pillowcases, making dresses that will be sent around the world to little girls so they can have something to wear. All right? If you go down in the, in the welcome center, you'll see on the one coat rack, I don't know, there's 30, 40, 50 of them, they keep showing up. We need to package them and send them somewhere, right? There are individuals who are serving in various spots around the church to help make things happen. Some of these people you never see and you never hear from. They're teachers or greeters. They're parts of the worship team. They're opening their homes for small group. They're providing meals for funeral dinners. They're helping with the kids ministry or the youth ministry. They're serving at the branch. Some of these people we never applaud, but they are working because they love God and they love others. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That is not an exhaustive list by any means, and I don't know if I could even create one. I know that there are some things that you are doing that I don't even know about. And I, I honestly, I'd, I'd love for you, grab a Connect card there in front of you. I'd love for you to do a little self-praise, okay, not for self, but for God. Right on there, what you do how you serve others, how you love others, whether it's through your job or whether it's through your community or whether it's just through relationships. Put that, put that drop it off in the offering plate and, and let us know so that we can celebrate as a church family that God is moving and God is alive and well. There's a handful of individuals that I'm going to invite up here uh, this morning. And so those of you that are coming, come. Uh, you know who you are. But I want to I share with us as a church family um, Again, first-hand accounts of some people that are loving God and loving their neighbor in some unique ways, in some um, different kind of ways. And the sole purpose of this is, is for encouragement. The sole purpose of this is that you will hear some ideas or you will hear from, from these individuals and that you will be encouraged that, wow, maybe I can do something as well. 
All right? And so, you want me to start down here? Okay. <laughs> we'll start down here. So, Rita, I'll sit next to you. Okay. That way I don't wander around. Rita, uh, Rita Royal, how long have you been part of this church? Uh, pretty Forever much all time, my right? life. Okay, yeah. Uh, and so... That's for people like me. <laughs> we won't say that. <laughs> um, so, Rita, you, you do something unique um, each week. Can you kind of share with us what that is? Yeah. On Thursday afternoons, Colonial Oaks, which is a retirement village in South Marion, um, they have a church service, and I volunteer on Thursdays to help bring the residents to the service and take them, transport them back and forth if they can't get there on their own. And I just go from hall to hall and invite people to come down and tell them where, what's going on. Why do you do that? Well, I got to know some of the residents there when my mother was there for two and a half years. And after she passed away, I felt this tugging at my heart to continue to visit with some of the people that I had made relationships with. And when I was there one day, uh, Pastor Chuck um, McCollum, he asked me about coming on Thursdays and helping to transport the people down. And so I felt that that solidified it for me, that that was one way that I could, on a regular basis, go and visit. Yeah. How have you seen God work in that environment or even through you by giving of your time and energy and, and your schedule? How, how have you seen God work in that? Well, um, I can definitely tell that the residents really enjoy just someone different coming along um, and a lot of times I have actually encouraged people to come that I know don't come on a regular basis and they start trickling in and they enjoy it enough that they come back hmm. um, as well as some of the staff um, there I have been able to witness to them and um, so you know, for me personally, I feel like that it has just blessed me with different relationships as well as strengthening um, my coming out of my shell, so to speak, my social anxieties. So, so you don't have a theology degree, do you? <laughs> nope. And, and you just referenced that you had anxieties. Mm hmm and yet God has you in this environment doing it. Correct. That's awesome. That's awesome. Pass it on to Maria there. <laughs> Maria Cox. Maria, you've been around a while? Eight years now. Okay. You're going to mm -hmm. have to talk in the microphone. Eight years. Okay. Um, <laughs> not as long so, as Rita. Not as long as Rita. Uh, so, so, Maria, you, uh, seasons, you've got, had some seasons of this, so share with us what that is. Um. I serve in prison ministry on Monday evenings. I go out to Miami Correctional Facility and um, um, basically share experience, strength, and hope with the men out there on and, Monday. And again, why? Um, a while, uh, a lot of you don't know my story, and I'll try not to. I'll try to make the long story short. But back in 1994, my first son was killed by his father. And uh, his father has uh, served time in prison and has been now released from uh, prison and is a free man out in Colorado. Back in 2014, um, my mind went blank, but Misty Wallace and Keith Blackburn came and shared their story with our church. And uh, sitting in the pew that I sit in, I felt like I was the only one sitting in the church at the time of their storytelling. Um, really tugged at my heart because I knew in my heart of hearts that I had never forgiven this man that had killed my child, and I didn't know how. Uh, when Keith and Misty came and told their story, um, I started the process of forgiveness for this man back in 2014, 20 years after the incident had happened, and um, met with Pastor Jeff on a couple of different occasions in trying to get through this forgiveness process and what it really meant to forgive. 
a few weeks after um, Scott, the father of my child, was released from prison, I received a phone call from Misty Blackburn asking if I would share my story at the men's prison. <laughs> and I fought it, and I fought it, and I fought it, and I said, no, I can't. I, I, I just can't enter a place. I mean, these men are evil, right? But um, God really tuck, tugged at my heart, and um, I, I finally went, and my father went with me to share my story. And within a year, it, it was a God God thing because within a year I was volunteering doing this. I did take a break this last year only because um, work got a little hectic and I couldn't get my schedule quite set, but God saw it fit to get me back into the prison this season. And how have you seen God work? Like a lot of healing on my side, um, a lot of forgiveness, uh, seeing these men as human beings, and also what you were saying in your sermon of God's children. Uh, he is also made in their image, and you know, all, all I kept thinking about sitting in my pew today was um, the, the verse of you visited me in prison. I mean, he, he is, it, he's everywhere. I mean, it's not, he just doesn't pick and choose. We've got to go out and, yeah. and love. And you, do you have a theology degree? <laughs> no. Yeah. All right. No. Jay-Z. Um, Jay-Z's been around five years. Okay, uh, so Jay-Z, there is something that's kind of developed in the last uh, couple years, specifically, uh, that has kind of just blossomed, um, and, and now God's using it. To, so share with us what that is. I sew for the Lord. I'm literally on needles and pins every day. <laughs> and uh, it, I love to make doll clothes. And so I, I started out by making doll clothes and giving them to little girls here, and that's my hobby. So, and then one day, Patty Painter came to me and said, uh, we're going to have an auction. Maybe you could get together a few outfits. And that gave me a really great idea. Well, I got together, I think it was like 26 outfits. I was, I just literally love it. It's not work at all. It's just I just love it, and it feels so good to be serving the Lord. So why, why are you making doll clothes? To raise money for missions, okay. and if you need it for benevolence fund, anything for the Lord. All right, and how have you seen God work through that? Well, he's changed my attitude because I always look at the things that I could not do instead of the things that I could do, and I turn something that I love to do into a service for the Lord. Thank you. Reagan, Reagan Tippy, uh, you've been around for a couple years. We, I guess we didn't plan this, but it's kind of <laughs> getting down here. So Reagan, um, Pastor Rob's and Melinda's daughter, but uh, Reagan, you had a unique experience this last summer. What did you do? Um, this last summer I spent a month in Uganda, Africa. A month in Uganda, okay. And Reagan, that was like the summer before your junior year. Uh, why in the world would a teenage girl want to give up a whole month to go to Uganda? Um, well, a couple years back, I felt God tugging on my heart that missions was something that he saw in my future. And I think um, a big thing with that is that when God places something on your heart, the best thing to do is to do it and to practice it. Um, and the family that I stayed with, I'm really close with their children, and uh, just their family means a lot to me. So um, I found it fit to go and to do as God had called me to do with a family that um, is very close to my heart. Awesome. And so how did you see God work? How did God work in you? How did you see God working when you were there in Uganda? Um, well, right away I noticed that the people in Uganda are so full of joy which was kind of shocking to me because growing up I always believed, you know, um, Africa is just so poverty stricken and uh, that they just don't have anything. So if they don't have anything, what do they have to be joyful about? Um, but I quickly found that they are so joyful um, with what the Lord has blessed them with. Um, I got to have many conversations with some of the local people uh, that Nathan and Jade um, work with and they explain stories of how uh, just 
they've had people and things taken away from them, but like they always said that they're so happy that God had blessed them with the life and blessed them with the people or with the opportunities at the time. So I was just really moved by how joyful they were with um, what they had and really taught me that um, being here living in the United States and having so many you know, clothes and so many um, people in my life that I can look up to and having a house over my head um, that I need to find more joy, that the joy that they find when they have nothing and here I am complaining all the time. So it was kind of a wake up call that I need to just think about what I have and to always be thankful um, with what God has given me. That's awesome. I share their story. They sh- I wanted them to share their stories. Um, a, a couple uh, tag-ons. One is, is with Rita, that uh, Jim Michener. Uh, we had a chance to talk this week. Jim Michener for years, for, what did you say, eight, ten years? Uh, Jim, each week, has been going into the nursing home visiting uh, some individuals that are there. And, uh, and so when I called Jim this week to see if he was still doing it, he said, no, unfortunately, his last two people had just passed away. And so he, he hasn't uh, gone for a little bit. But, but Jim, on his own, because he loves God and loves others, was going to do that. Uh, Joe Biddle, who's uh, a member of this church and, and on a missions team, uh, he also goes to the, mis- or to the prison. And uh, he, he's a chaplain for the Marion Police Department. And he, that's part of his desire and passion. With Jay Z, I know that there are a number of you that have given Jay Z scraps, and, and that just brightens her day uh, when she has some scrap uh, uh, material because that means more doll clothes, which means more money for missions. Uh, and here's somebody that we've had kind of, no, I'm not going to Reagan yet, I'm still talking about you, Jay Z. Here's somebody that, that we've had a chance to talk uh, on the trip to Cambodia, somebody that had never left. Uh, the country, never been on an airplane, goes to Cambodia a couple years ago on our mission trip, and just the chance to hear her heart, uh, and and for somebody to say, I don't have anything to give, God has, God has opened the floodgates to help her realize that she does have something to give. She can uh, make an impact in the community. And then Reagan, who, um, to chance to, to, to know her heart, and to hear how she is changing uh, her community, she is a she is a bright light uh, in her school, and uh, and and full of joy and passion for the Lord, and and God has put on that in her heart that desire to serve the Lord and and to be in missions and in ministry, and and so that that's kind of that career path, and so I'm I'm excited about that, but this is this is us, none of these three four. One might at some day, but none, none of them have a ministry degree or a theology degree. They're just living life, right? When we go back to Luke chapter 10, the expert in the law asked Jesus, trying to trip him up, just go ahead and stay put, how, how do we, um, what's, the, what's the law say? You know, how do we inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what's the law say? They come back, love God and love others. Jesus basically says, we'll go do it. Well, wait a minute, who's my neighbor? Jesus gives the parable of the Samaritan. Go to the last verse of that that chapter, verse 37. And it says, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I want to say thank you to each of you for publicly going and doing likewise living out the love of God and trying to serve others in some unique and practical ways. Would you just say thank you to them? Give them a round of applause. Our worship team's coming up. We're going we're gonna to close with one final song. But I want, uh, as we do, I want us to, I want us to be encouraged. <laughs> I, I, want us to, I want us to celebrate that God is at work, that God is doing some amazing things within our church, within our homes, within our lives. Uh, and if you have this story, please share it. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't want to share those stories because it's like, I don't want to brag about myself. I'm giving you permission. Brag about what God is doing through your life to change people, that you're actually living out the love God, love others.